So I'm going to start this review by saying something kind of controversial. Blue Beetle isn't a terrible superhero movie. You gotta be <laughs> kidding. In fact, dare I say it, I actually found myself kind of enjoying it at times. It's got a likeable cast of characters played by actors that mostly seem invested in what they're doing, some decent emotional beats that hit home more effectively than I expected, a bunch of jokes that made me smile more than an entire phase of MCU movies, and a simple but charmingly old-fashioned central theme of family loyalty and self-discovery that works just as well as it always has. In short, Blue Beetle is a film that fits neatly into the category of cheeseburger movie for me, a production that doesn't try to do anything particularly new, ambitious or subversive, and as a result, never goes too far wrong. Instead, it's content to go through its familiar, tried and tested story beats with the kind of cheerful, plucky optimism that seems to be largely missing from so many films today. A movie with less than half the budget of your average Marvel effort, but which seems to have made the most of every penny available. And if it had come out four or five years ago when superhero main was at its peak, then I think it probably would have pulled in a decent profit for DC and might even have been enough to greenlight a sequel. Unfortunately, it didn't. Instead, it had the rotten luck of coming out in 2023, and it feels like a movie with almost every possible factor set against it. A largely unknown character played by a largely unknown actor, coming at the tail end of an aborted cinematic universe that's about to get James Gunned into irrelevancy, at a time when the entire superhero genre is entering its twilight years anyway. I mean, really, what were they expecting with this one? The opening weekend was abysmal, and I don't imagine that it's gonna get any better better from here. And it's a shame because like I say, I don't consider it to be a terrible movie. In fact, it's probably better than almost anything I've seen from Marvel over the past couple of years. And yes, I'm aware that that's a very low benchmark. The film centres around Jaime Reyes, a college graduate who's on his way home to his family in Palmera City now that he's finished his studies. And holy shit, that's Elpidia Carrillo from Predator! Damn, it's a fucking weird experience when you know an actor from one childhood movie and then don't see them in anything for like 30 years. I feel like some kind of weird time traveller or something. Unfortunately, he soon finds out that his family have fallen on hard times, their business is failing, their house is due to be repossessed, and his father even suffered a heart attack in his absence. They didn't tell him about any of this stuff, of course, because they didn't want to worry him. Anyway, Jaime's determined to help right the ship and use his degree to get a decent job that can solve their financial problems. Unfortunately, all he's able to get is a cleaner for Victoria Cord, the head of a major weapon manufacturing company. Kind of like DC's answer to Stark Industries. And if you're starting to notice parallels here, then strap in because there's a lot more to come. Anyway, Jaime's job doesn't last long when he intervenes in an argument between Victoria and her niece Jenny, who's starting to ask a lot of uncomfortable questions about a highly classified project they've been working on. Jenny takes pity on him and suggests that he meet up with her tomorrow with the promise of finding a new role. Unfortunately, that just so happens to be when she decides to steal a top secret piece of alien tech tech called the Scarab from the company's lab. You probably shouldn't have invited him over on that particular day, in fairness, Jenny. Also, I love how the fact that her grand plan is to walk out with it in a takeaway food container, because I guess the most sensitive piece of technology in the company's possession isn't protected by security cameras, motion sensors, armed guards, or even a fucking locked box. It's just sitting right there on a lab table for anyone to help themselves to. Shite. Shite. <laughs> Shite. Shite. Anyway, whatever. Jenny's plan quickly goes tits up when the theft gets noticed, which forces her to hand the scarab off to Jaime, on strict instructions that he doesn't open the box or mess with it in any way. So naturally, as soon as he gets home, he opens the box and starts messing with it, and before you know it, the scarab's grafted itself onto his spinal column and turned his body into a flying, armoured superhero that can communicate with him. It's a bit like Iron Man crossed with Venom, only not as interesting as either. Clearly he's going to need some help getting this thing off him, so he goes to speak with Jenny, who just happens to be fleeing from her apartment with Cord security chasing after her. Well, wow, talk about good timing. I mean, if he'd shown up literally seconds later, they would have caught and probably killed her. So anyway, they go back to his house, because I guess there's no way that Cord would realise he was in the building during the scarab theft and trace him back to his home address, and she explains that the only way to remove it is by using her father's secret lab. And the only key just so happens to be at Cord headquarters, where security is apparently now a thing because it's convenient to the plots. Luckily for them though, Jaime's uncle Rudy just so happens to have a homemade jamming device that can neutralise all the security systems in the building. Oh yes, that's shite. 
Wow, that was lucky. So they go and get the key and have a fight with Victoria's henchman, who also has a suit of power armor, but then Jaime's family get attacked because for some reason they still think it's safe to be chilling out at their home address, despite everything that's happened up until this point. Don't, uh, don't go for a career in espionage, guys. The upshot is that Jaime gets captured so that Victoria can extract the secrets of the scarab from his body and use it to make a whole army of the fucking things, and for some reason she just leaves Jenny and the rest of the family behind. WHAT. THE. FUCK. Like, these people have already infiltrated your most secure facility, you fucking Q-tip. Jenny alone knows the intimate details of your operation. She's highly intelligent and clearly a major threat to your plans. At the very least, you should place them all under arrest, because otherwise you know they're just gonna come back and rescue Jaime and totally scupper your whole operation. Ah, whatever. So there's a big CGI fight and a bunch of explosions, and the evil henchman redeems himself, and the bad guy gets their comeuppance, and the good guys go back to their home to rebuild their lives, and Jaime decides to use his Blue Beetle powers for good. And that's it, that's the plot for generic superhero movie number 5271. Like I said earlier, Blue Beetle is a film that fits perfectly into the current DC mold of bland, inoffensive, unambitious superhero flicks that don't really aspire to be anything more than lightweight, forgettable entertainment. It's very much cut from the same cloth as Black Adam, Shazam 2 and The Flash, the only major difference being that there's no particular selling point for this film. There's no big stars attached to it, no major appearances from established characters, no exciting, world-changing events that will have big repercussions going forward. It's a movie that exists more or less in isolation, forced to stand on its own merits, and that's where the real problem lies because at this point, well, there's not a huge amount to recommend it. The days when studios could shit out generic movies about obscure superheroes and expect to rake in big profits are long gone. In fact, I could argue that DC never even made it to that level in the first place, and the fact that the whole universe is about to get rebooted offers even less incentive to get invested in Blue Beetle. I mean, I don't pretend to know anything about the comic book version, but his powers and abilities seem to be roughly in line with Iron Man. There's nothing especially novel or inventive about him. Likewise, the plot isn't exactly breaking new ground in terms of narrative complexity. There's all the familiar story beats you'd expect from a superhero movie, and an irritating over-reliance on convenience, contrivance and coincidence to keep things moving forwards. I mean, the characters themselves are charming enough, I guess. Jaime is a likeable, if slightly forgettable forgettable protagonist struggling to find his way in life, Jenny's smart and driven but compassionate and caring, and Rudy's a maverick loose cannon who comes through when it counts. Carapax is big and intimidating and actually gets more depth than I expected for a henchman like this, but he probably should have just been the main antagonist because fuck me, Victoria Cord's about as interesting as that bald guy from Ant-Man. Surprised to see me? Fuck. She makes stroke-inducingly dumb decisions and takes absolutely no precautions that the subordinates she treats like dog shit might actually turn against her. Which kind of brings me on to one of the less enjoyable aspects of this movie, the social commentary. There was clearly some attempt to push this film as Black Panther for Mexican people, with some pretty heavy-handed messaging about Jaime and his family being disadvantaged, discriminated against and generally looked down on by the privileged white people around them. I mean, there's definitely interesting stuff that you could explore there, but the film never really takes the time to do it properly. It feels more like a rushed afterthought, written into the script at the 11th hour to try to stir up a bit of social media controversy. I don't think it had quite the effect you were looking for, guys. Ultimately, Blue Beetle feels like a decent, well-meaning enough film that just had the rotten luck of coming along a few years too late. You didn't exactly need a crystal ball to know that this movie was practically set up to fail, barely advertised by a studio that had no faith in it, and released during that awkward dead zone when the summer box office season has already wound down. I didn't hate it, and in a way, I actually feel kinda sorry for it. I don't know, maybe I'm just a sucker for hard luck stories, but it might have been interesting to see what this movie could have been if it hadn't come along at the worst time possible. As it stands, it's probably gonna go down as just a minor footnote in DC movie history, forgotten as quickly as it came. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.